I love inertia. Inertia tells me where I am, it tells me how I'm moving. It gives me a frame of reference for my physical existence. And it gives me a frame of reference for my thoughts. Because ideas, which I love having, ideas have inertia too. Good ideas have lots of inertia. Good ideas have huge amount of inertia. And bad ideas have no inertia. Bad ideas you can push aside. It's very easy. They have no weight. What I'm going to try and talk to you today about is how you build inertia for ideas. Because if you have the way of building up and working out which are the good ideas and which are the bad ideas, you're free to have ideas. You can have as many as you like. Because the bad ones you'll just throw away. It's not a big stress. You just keep on having ideas. So, I'm going to tell you about the inertia of ideas. There's only one truly bad idea, and that is the idea that tells you that there are some ideas that you should not test. That is a truly bad idea. All the others can be tested, and you can have whatever you want, however much fun you want with those ideas. Now, I'm a physicist, so I'm going to try and walk you through a, a, a story of ideas in physics. And for that, I need you to know a little bit of physics. So we're going to have one slide of physics. And I hope this will not be too traumatic for all of you. And this is the bit of physics you need to know. The universe is very big. Now, that is not an obvious statement. That the universe is everything is relatively straightforward. The word actually says it. But that it's big is a different thing. Now, the reason this piece of physics matters is because if the universe is very big, there's only one force that governs how the universe behaves. That's the force of gravity. All the other ones that make radios work and atoms and all of this thing happen, they don't matter. The universe doesn't care, because the universe is very big. So if you're going to talk about gravity, you have to talk about this fellow. This is uh, a drawing of Isaac Newton. Now, Isaac Newton was probably the smartest person to have ever lived at the time that he was around. Smarter than every single person, any person that lived before him. And he did amazing things. But today we're talking about ideas of gravity, so we'll talk about gravity. And it's a famous story, amongst physicists anyway, that Newton sat under an apple tree, saw an apple fall, and wondered how that worked. Now, that's quite a complicated thing to happen, because an apple falls down in Greece, but it also falls down in Australia. But in Australia, down is the other way around. So how does the apple know? That's quite a complicated process and quite a complicated piece of physics. But he had a great idea about how that worked. Things attract each other, and gravity pulls things together. And with this brilliant idea, he could explain why apples fall down, doesn't matter which side of the planet you're on, and how the planets went around the sun. This idea could be tested. It could collect inertia. It could be an idea upon which we could build other things. It was a strong idea. It was a good idea. It had inertia. It was such a good idea that in the 1800s, astronomers like myself measured the orbit of Uranus, a planet, the last planet we could see, and worked out that there was something wrong with the orbit of Uranus. It didn't fit with Newton's idea. What should we do? And in fact, the idea is so good that it could predict and it could test. And they said, there has to be another planet outside Uranus, outside the orbit of Uranus. There had to be another planet. And in fact, they said it had to be exactly there. So astronomers went and measured and found Neptune. Neptune was discovered because we tested an idea. So, I mean, amongst astronomers, this is pretty cool. We found a planet, right? This is, this, this, is, this is great. If you can measure some planets, find a problem, and then you find other planets, 
Now, this is cool. So we went off and measured all the planets, trying to find a mistake. And in fact, Mercury also had a problem in its orbit. Mercury's orbit was wrong by half an arc second a year. Now, an arc second is a, an angle. It's a small angle. If you held your arm at your thumb at arm's length, and you cut your thumb in 3,600 slices, an arc second would be one of those slices. And Mercury was wrong by half of that every year. And we looked for the other planet. Well, I didn't. It was 100 years ago. We looked for another planet, couldn't find another planet. To fix this problem, we have to go to another very clever man, another very clever idea, Einstein. Einstein comes along, says, I've got a theory, the general theory of relativity, and with this theory, space bends and funny stuff happens, and Mercury's orbit is right. The 43 arc seconds a century goes away. It can be tested. The enormous inertia of Newton's idea goes away because it tested and failed. It's a profound moment in physics, but also in the development of ideas. Now, Einstein's general, uh, general relativity predicted all kinds of other stuff. It predicted that the light from objects would be changing its course as it passed the gravity of heavy things. And arcs in the sky would appear, arcs like these ones. The yellow galaxies that you see here are closer to us, and the stretchy things, the arcs that you see around, are galaxies behind this cluster of galaxies. And their light has been bent by the gravity of the objects in front. This is a test of an idea. The inertia of the general theory of relativity increases. You have great confidence about what is happening. The general theory of relativity is so great a theory that we can actually model and work out what the entire universe is doing, this very big thing, right? Not little things, this is the very big thing, everything. We have a theory to actually explain how everything is behaving. And Einstein puts all his equations together and he finds that the universe is kind of like, ah, he wants to, maybe wants to get a little bit smaller, or maybe a little bit bigger, it's, it's not quite sure, it's, it's, it's like on an edge. And he goes to the astronomer and says, what's the universe doing? He says, nothing. I mean, nothing. Nothing, it's just sitting there. It's doing nothing. So there's a bit of scratching of head. He says, I can fix that. So Einstein introduced the cosmological constant, uh, the letter Lambda is familiar to all of you. It's a capital version of it. It's, uh, it stands for, as I said, the cosmological constant. And this fixed the universe. It no longer was trying to do one thing or another. It just stayed still. And all was good. Until uh, astronomers started measuring the universe, because now we had a theory we could actually test. We could go out and say, oh, measuring the universe this is pretty cool. You can actually measure the whole universe. This is nice. You need telescopes, and we build lots of telescopes. They're kind of expensive and big and all kinds of other stuff. But it's cool. You go out and measure stuff. And a uh, rather famous astronomer you may have heard of, uh, Edwin Hubble, used this telescope. This is the 100-inch uh, at Mount Wilson. And he measured how, star how galaxies were moving in the, in the universe and how far away they were. And he worked out that the universe was not kind of doing nothing. Actually, it was doing something very important. It was getting bigger. The universe is expanding. Now, that messed up Einstein. So we threw away lambda. It didn't matter that Einstein came up with it. Eh? It was a bad idea. It could be tested, and it was a bad idea. And we have this beautiful result now. We have a universe that is actually getting bigger. Now that's kind of weird because you'd like to know what it's going to do. So our universe has stuff in it. We know that because we're here, right? You're here, so the universe has stuff in it. Stuff has gravity. So the universe, as it's expanding, has to do one of three things. If there's a lot of stuff in the universe, 
then the gravity will actually hold it together and at some point it will stop expanding and it will actually get smaller again. If the universe doesn't have enough stuff in it, then it will keep on expanding forever, but it will slow down because stuff has gravity, so it will, it will be slowing down, but it will never slow down enough to, to, to stop getting bigger. And if the universe is just perfect, just right, absolutely perfect, it will become the perfect size. It will expand and end up being the perfect size. It will take forever, but it will become the perfect size. And that would be a perfect universe. So measuring how the universe is growing is fun, right? I mean, you know, who doesn't want to know? Well, maybe you don't want to know, but, you know, I think if you're asking questions, this is a pretty good question to be asking. Now, one of the things about the universe being big and expanding is that at some point it was smaller than it is today. And if it was smaller and has all of the stuff, it will be hotter too. And that heat is light, and we can see this light. In fact, every time you tune your television, you see this white snow. Some of that white snow is some of this light. And by measuring our universe when it was much younger, we can work out certain things. We can work out, in fact, that our universe is perfect. It's one of these perfect universes. This is a picture of our universe when it was a baby. So in the equivalent age, it would be a picture of me when I was 10 hours old. Okay? So this is a picture of our universe when it was 300,000 years old. Today, our universe is 13.7 billion years old. In fact, we know the age of our universe more accurately than most people in this room know their own. And this picture tells us something very magic. It tells us that our universe is complete. It tells us that our density is exactly the right one. So now, we can go out and measure the deceleration, how it's slowing down, and we can do amazing things. We have an explanation for how our universe works. It's a very strong idea. It's pretty cool. So in the mid-1990s, uh, two teams of astronomers uh, decided to go off and measure how our universe was slowing down. Um, for that, uh, I was part of one of the teams. Uh, we used supernovae. Supernovae are bright uh, explosions of stars in other galaxies, and they become very bright, and you can see them at great, great distances. And you measure them, and you can measure how far away they are, and you can measure how our universe is behaving. Well, a um, bit of a problem, because our universe is not slowing down. It's full of stuff, but it's not slowing down. In fact, our universe is expanding in an accelerating, at an accelerating rate. Our universe is getting bigger faster. Our universe is made of very weird stuff. Our universe is made of things like us, the stars, the galaxies, the planets, yourselves, the chairs, all of this is 4% of our universe. Even the stuff between the galaxies, all of that is 4% of our universe. 23% of our universe is uh, stuff we call dark matter, which changes how our galaxies turn and how they get put together, etc., etc. But what we discovered in 1998 is that 70% of our universe today is made out of a thing we call dark energy. Uh, we have a good name for it. We do not have any idea what it actually is. But it is making our universe get bigger faster. It's never going to come down and the future is very, very, very dark and bleak. Not to worry, not in anybody's lifetime. But we are physicists, and we need to have a mathematical way of describing this. And I'm sure you can guess what we're using. Lambda, the idea that was bad, the idea that we threw away because it didn't work with the test, we can bring it back. And in fact, the cosmological constant is one way we describe this bizarre universe 
in which we live in. So I love the inertia of ideas. I love the process which allows us to challenge any idea with a test. Ideas that cannot be tested don't have inertia. They may be fun to have, and you can live with them and have a great time, but they do not carry weight. They're great and can be entertaining, but we build edifices on top of inertia. And the process by which you free yourself to have any idea you want is the process by which you subject your ideas to test. And you are happy when your bad idea dies because nobody wants to have bad ideas hanging around. Thank you very much.